We are recording now. Okay, so welcome everyone to this virtual interim meeting of the co-working group. I am Marco Tivoca, my co-chair is uh, Jaime Jimenez. And as a reminder, this is an official ITF meeting, so the not well applies. Be sure to be familiar with it. If you're not already, uh, it's not about IPR and patents only. It's also about code of conduct. Uh, so be sure to be nice uh, to each other. And the agenda for today is mainly about uh, two items. First one, the uh, dial link document as to overall next steps and uh, the document split that we discussed before um, at the March meeting, and we are close to uh, actually implement. And then the second item is about the href and Corel document to discuss a few selected open points from the design team and mostly uh, CRI compression. Does anyone want to bash this agenda or add anything? No, uh, before we start, I saw Francesca, any input update question from your side? Um, I don't think so, nothing new. All right, thank you. Then we can start with the first item, dial link and- Before we go into that, maybe just a quick Sure. observation about the Yang Sibo and uh, SID documents. So there, there is some movement. We had a couple of uh, short meetings discussing what to do. Ivalo made a lot of changes. I'm probably going to make a few uh, very small changes now, and then we should be uh, ready for new versions, uh, I hope, tomorrow. And uh, if all works out very well, then we uh, might uh, be able to resume the ISG processing. Sounds great. Thank you. There was also one more thing I wanted to bring up. Um, and it's just that uh, lately at the ASG, a lot of drafts um, have been, if not blocked, there has been some some discussion about how they fit in the charter uh, of the working group that has brought them forward. So I, I just wanted to give a reminder, this is more for the chairs and um, the shepherd. Um, uh, when doing the shepherd write-up, uh, it's it's good to also check that um, the document it fits with the charter and if, you know, if there is any um, if if there is any um, um, let's say interpretation that needs to be done, um, then let let's have the conversation before it reaches ISG so that it can be cleared up more quickly. So it's just something to keep in mind. Indeed, thank you. Okay, um, so let's take the first item for today. Uh, Dime link, uh, Bill, the floor is yours. Just let me know when to change light. Thank you, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Marco, just full screen, please, if you can. I'm excuse, sorry? Marco, if you could full screen. Oh, thanks. It, it should be already. I mean, I saw you see a browser, but it should be basically full screen already. You can always zoom in in WebEx. Okay. Better now. <laughs> Looks good, thanks. Okay, are we ready to go? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, and uh, thanks for inviting us to the interim to present this work. So um, this is a quick update about what's happening in DynLink. There hasn't been very much movement, but there is one significant change that will occur. So I'm gonna just go through that. Um, Marco, can you put to the next slide, please? 
So the current DynLink uh, draft is at version 13. It hasn't uh, been updated since the the, uh, the last IETF meeting. And um, we will, uh, as, as, as going forward, we will continue to incorporate feedback and then uh, think about corrections and clarifications as well. But there is uh, uh, one thing that 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 is uh, was discussed in the previous IETF meetings, and then I thought I'll start effecting it um, just a few days ago because I have been so busy with my work that I was not able to do much more before that. But that required some discussions with the area directors, the core chairs, and also the authors, and um, we all agreed uh, the way forward. So in in short, DynLink will be split into two documents. Uh, both of them will be working group documents. Um, and there will be two different sections from the current DynLink draft that will be um, kind of uh, uh, taken and, and, and put into these documents. So um, if Marco, you can move to the next slide. This is going to be a little bit difficult for you to see when you actually um, have it in th this form, but, but I can just uh, explain what this is. So, so I just took a, a snapshot of the uh, DynLink version 13 draft, the table of contents, and um, show you that, um, okay, there's one, yeah, okay, never mind. There's, um, there are, you know, the, the, the document itself is actually pretty well structured and that made it very easy to consider how to split this forward. But essentially in, in DynLink, there are, there are two parts. The one part uh, of DynLink, the first part, uh, talks about uh, conditional observation and, and uh, observe parameters that could be sent on a query uh, to to kind of look at notifications that can come back uh, based on changes in the resource representations on the server side. And uh, these conditional attributes uh, are used in two different ways. So there's basically the notification attributes and then there are the control attributes to control server behavior. And that is one part of DynLink. The second part of DynLink is on the dynamic links itself, the, the link representations, how you do the bindings, uh, what are the attributes there, and then also the um, the link relations and, and and binding tables, and the link bindings depends on the conditional attributes, but not the other way around, not vice versa. And um, the main issue with DynLink has been that one part of the draft has been uh, ready for a long time, and and the other part has still uh, requires quite a lot of work, and the the, the that is what led to this uh, issue that uh, the split will occur in such a way that all the things that are related to conditional attributes will be extracted and separated into a new working group draft, uh, draft core conditional attributes. And then the that will be version zero. And then the rest of it, the rest of the draft that is in DynLink will be um, moved into version 14 of DynLink. So there won't be a new, like a new name for the rest of it. It's, it's con it continues to be called uh, DynLink. Why is this going to take it take place like this? Um, if we move to the next slide, so why the changes? And as I explained, firstly there are two distinct sections. Uh, one part has moved forward uh, in a, in a, in very very good time, and then the other part still on development. Uh, especially the uh, the fact is that uh, link bindings and binding tables, we need to look at the work a bit more closely um, with relation to things like Coral. Then the other aspect to this is that there is a dependency on this draft from other SDOs, especially uh, Lightweight M2M. And, but the dependency is not to the link bindings, it's, it's to the conditional uh, observe attributes, uh, which means that the, the, the longer DynLink takes to be standardized, the, the more the chances that the, the Lightweight M2M specs will um, essentially replicate the, the data and then you know, uh, DynLink would lose its, its relevance. So um, the work on conditional attributes is almost finished and uh, it makes sense to separate them. So then once we have separated them, the live and to m specs will um, refer to core conditional attributes. And then if that can proceed rapidly towards RFC, then uh, it does not create any pressure on the link bindings to be ready on time. And, and that's the basic justification for, for um, doing it like this. And uh, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm going to try to submit these two drafts as soon as I can, um, perhaps this week. Um, the first versions will be just just a um, copy paste of the um, the text from draft 13 towards these two new new uh, versions of the drafts, 
and then we will start to proceed to evolve them separately. So then there's some, some kind of continuation that um, anybody who looks at these drafts will know that they came from the same work. Um, I also don't want to create any inconsistencies because the link, uh, the links, link bindings, they depend on the conditional attributes part. So it's necessary to submit the, the uh, conditional at observe attribute draft first and then start to refer to it in the in the draft uh, 14 of the dime link. Okay, can we move to the next slide, please? Right, so um, if we take the fact that zero, zero does not actually have any any kind of any kind of um, uh, major changes, what will change to version zero one? So this is one thing that we have always been considering. Um, what is the impact of the um, presence of um, gateways and proxies, uh, especially caching proxies and so on, between the path of a client and the origin server? And we have always uh, decided that with uh, conditional attributes and conditional observed to be hop to hop, hop by hop, sorry, and not end to end. And um, we took a decision that this will be included into the implementation consideration section. Uh, the next part of that is that there is a scope for some possible security considerations. And then uh, we might want to rep update the reference code uh, for server processing. Uh, the, the, the original uh, code was uh, contributed by Michael. And um, at the time that we actually had the code in there, we did not have things like epmin and epmax. It was depending simply on pmax uh, to understand when, when to do the sampling. So this kind of things are probably something we could consider. And then it's ready for a working group last call. So, so there's not much work there. The next slide, please. Um, okay, I see something on chat. I'm not sure if it's directed to me or uh, for everybody, but um, I'll just continue with this part. And uh, if anybody wants to um, say something, please, please continue. So um, then, then comes the dying link and draft itself. So what, what does that require? That's that's a little bit more tricky. So uh, while the conditional attributes draft moves forward uh, in version 14 of dying link, uh, uh, sorry, this should be actually version 14 to version 15, um, shortcomings seen with the core link format uh, to describe uh, these link bindings should be addressed. Um, currently they are in the binding table and um, we have been looking to see what, what would be better ways to represent the, the link bindings. Is it a, a new way of representing it with calling format or is it using something like Coral to, to do that? Uh, so that's that's the work at least that we have identified for now for, for Dying Link itself. And I think this is the last slide that I have. I don't think I have any more. Right. So that's it. Um, please, if you have any questions. Yeah, there's comments for you in the chat and in the minutes already from Christian. <laughs> yeah, but I think I'll, I'll cue myself at the latest spot of the question. So anything that's more related to the document should probably go first. Yeah, Michael, do you want to so, bring your yeah, question? Yeah, I'm not you? sure about, um, so Michael Koster, Passive Logic, um, not sure how we're running the queue here, but uh, I just wanted to point out, we probably don't have to have a normative dependency between the bindings draft calling out the dying link draft. It's just really one way of implementing the attributes. I'm not sure how exactly to handle it, but they should be able to proceed independently, I think, without normative dependency. But again, I'm not sure how the references work. It, it doesn't really depend on it in a in a logical way. It's just no, a, no. A sort it's of, a, it might be an informative reference. Only. Sure, yeah. And then we can stop there from being too much coupling. Yeah, yeah. But, but essentially, the draft has, has to exist first before we can refer to it. So that's what I was trying to say. So. Yeah, it does need to refer to it, um, yeah. and and probably more than just as an example. So maybe informative or whatever. But yeah, yeah. sure. And um, I can update the C code for that. I don't think it's going to require a new way of of uh, documenting it. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Actually, uh, Crandall RFC allows you to reference drafts that don't exist, uh, because uh, otherwise you sometimes run into a circular dependencies. Mm -hmm. uh, so just just a comment for authors. Okay. Thanks, Karsten. Um, brief note on the topic of of proxy coexistence. Um, this might be a good point to spin up a discussion that 
was uh, was a bit raised uh, in earlier discussions of this uh, on on what do we expect uh, on in terms of, of best practice of working group documents with respect to to how core is used so um Hannes is not here today if I see correctly um, but at least he and I do have different opinions on how relevant is it for core documents to work across proxies and maybe we should reserve some time for for discussion on that top for general discussion on how we see how how relevant we see proxy support um, as a working group for future documents that come out of this okay So this was a comment on conditional attributes or on the dying link part? Uh, conditional, conditional attributes. Okay, then I know what you're talking about. Hmm. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, then thanks. We'll come back to the next updates in the next interims. Thank you, Bill. Then we can move to the next item, and that's Karsten. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, th first, let me first try to, to get the context uh, of this clear. We have this activity uh, finishing Coral that we, we took over from the Think to Think Research Group. And uh, one question that uh, came up is how exactly do we want to reference the URIs uh, in in our uh, environment? And um, that's uh, maybe something that is important for Coral, but of course it's something that can be used in other places as well. For instance, in Suit, uh, URIs play an important role, and th there may be a good reason to have a concise form for URIs for Suit as well and so on and so on so the the part that i'm talking about is, is part of coral but it's also something that uh, possibly has wider apl applicability if other people also like uh, to to get rid of the the syntax um, aspect of uris and and want to focus on the uh, semantics next slide please So basically, the, the draft, draft ITF core href, uh, defines uh, CRIs, or I like to call them curries, uh, whatever. And uh, not only those, but also CRI references. So the difference between a curry and a curry reference is that a curry is, is uh, complete. You can uh, start dereferencing that, while a curry reference only works relative to a base uh, the CRI that uh, provides the, the missing pieces. So an example for a curry reference would be something like slash dot well known slash core, which you cannot dereference without knowing wh which protocol to use and, and uh, where the host is and, and what the port number is. Um, so both are uh, defined on the URI side in, in RFC 3986. And um, we are trying to, to essentially do the same thing, but try to, do, to lose as much of the complexity as possible. And those of you who have been around for a decade or so, uh, we essentially tried to do this in the development uh, of CoAP. So CoAP has a specific view of URIs and an encoding of URIs um, that is essentially trying to to reduce the complexity for instance by not allowing percent uh, encoding um, next slide please so um, a lot of uh, discussion happened over the course of two years or so and uh, finally jim shard made a proposal that uh, after a lot more additional discussion uh, mutated into what you are seeing here, uh, which essentially has uh, six components uh, of a, a curry reference. 
um, a scheme and authority, something called discard, uh, a sequence of path segments, a sequence of query segments and uh, fragment. And uh, all of this is optional. Um, so th that's why this is a little bit complicated because the, the rules, how this optionality actually is uh, reflected in the syntax uh, cause uh, a little bit more complexity than, than we would uh, really like to uh, have here. But that is the, the current uh, uh, proposal. Actually, it's a slightly fixed version of the current proposal. In Dash of 4, uh, the, the null you see here is still an empty array, and that, that's slightly confusing. So uh, this uh, in the current editor's draft, this has been replaced by um, a null. Next slide, please. So um, the the syntax that we have here is uh, uh, quite efficient. So th there have been attempts to come up with bespoke uh, syntax that, that is kind of derived from uh, the, the co-op uh, option syntax. And uh, there is not really much advantage of one over the other. And since the co-op uh, uh, UI syntax is, is really optimized, um, uh, I think that that's an interesting uh, observation. Um, the, the disadvantage of getting this very, very concise form is that uh, when you are ingesting uh, Cori, uh, then you actually uh, have to uh, look at the thing and, and uh, essentially sort the various components that you are seeing to the six components that I talked about. So the abstract content, as I said, is schema authority, discard, path, query, fragment. And uh, uh, whether a particular item in the array that you are getting uh, is, is a scheme or maybe a path component or a query component or a host name and so on, you, you have to uh, find that out from uh, the, the context. Um, so this requires some code and it's, it's easier to do internal processing uh, based on this uh, uh, very simple schema I'm, I'm showing on this uh, slide. So my code, for instance, actually does the transformation on, on the ingest. So when, when you uh, uh, read a CRI, then it, it gives you this array as an internal data structure to work from. Um, so let's look at a few examples. Next slide, please. Um, we are uh, on, on the left side, we, we are seeing the uh, UI, and, and on the right side, uh, we are uh, seeing the uh, new syntax. And this slide is slightly misleading because it only shows the relative references. So it only shows uh, UI references that don't have a host name and a scheme uh, and so on. Um, what happened? Oh, uh, something weird happened here with, with the, the line with a dot uh, in it. So this, this is actually two lines. Anyway, so um, what we see is that, that a slash is essentially an empty array and a slash A is an array with just the A in it. And a slash A slash B is an array with the A and the B. Uh, in it, and uh, an AB with a foo is, is uh, an array with two path segments and one array that contains all the query uh, components. So if there were, was a foo and bar, uh, this uh, array with a foo in it would be um, a two, uh, would have two elements. Um, yeah, so th there is a certain system uh, behind that uh, for the uh, relative URI references that have absolute paths. Um, you really have to love the, the 3986 uh, terminology here. Anyway, um, there are also relative URI references that have a relative uh, path. And the interesting question always is how much of the uh, base URI do we need to discard uh, before going on? So if we simply say A, as a URI reference, this means take the current path, uh, which is usually just the URI of the document that, that contains the link, 
remove the final path component and put in an A instead. So if you have a, a foo.html and that has a link A, uh, then after that you have a, a URI that, that ends in A instead of uh, foo.html. So that's why this card is set to one here. Uh, a single dot just discards the last component. A, a double dot uh, goes up one level. So dot dot becomes uh, uh, discard two. Um, dot dot slash a, slash a becomes a discard two and append a. Uh, dot dot slash a uh, query foo. Uh, and so on. So I think you can see the, the uh, principle here. So the discard encodes um, the, the number of path segments that have to be removed from the, the end of the URI base uh, to generate the merged uh, or the resolved uh, URI. Um, the, the interesting thing is that uh, it's possible to, to uh, write URI references that uh, do not have any path component in them. And uh, for those, we have uh, uh, assigned the discard value of zero. So th this is like the other discard values, except that we just don't discard anything from the base. So if you have slash a slash b slash c and, and apply a relative uh, reference question mark foo to that, you discard nothing and add a query uh, component foo. And finally, if we have a fragment identifier, uh, we have to separate this uh, from the uh, path components, or you will confuse the path components with the uh, uh, reference, uh, with a fragment. Uh, so we insert a null, uh, unless there's also a query, then we have the query array, uh, which replaces the null. And finally, a completely empty UI reference uh, becomes a simple discard zero. Uh, so um, the, the, the slash becomes the shortest possible uh, curry, and uh, the second shortest is the, the discard zero uh, case. So the, what's slightly longer in the UI is uh, slightly shorter in the curry and, and back. Okay, so th that's the syntax that uh, I think is, is uh, uh, quite uh, compact, but also quite elegant. It just requires a little bit of serial processing uh, to take out the various parts and assign, assign them to the, the various roles um, that we have. Um, so one, one idea that came up, next slide, please. Uh, one idea that came up, um, if that internal array is, is so useful for doing the processing, why don't we just send that thing over the wire? Um, so, uh, for instance, a slash, well, that, that's an array that's, that's entirely filled with null values, and we don't need to send trailing null values, so it becomes an empty array on the right side of the table. Or a slash a uh, becomes three null values for scheme authority and discard, and uh, then the a, uh, and so on. So you see what's going on there. Uh, we essentially um, insert a couple of nulls at the beginning because we, we don't have a scheme and an authority in these examples. In other examples, of course, we are not inserting anything. And uh, this allows us to essentially have a positional semantics of the array elements. But it also costs additional bytes, both for inserting these null values, um, but also for uh, packaging uh, so, for instance, if you look at the, the isolated A after the slash question mark foo, um, this uh, takes two additional bytes for the null null, but also a third byte for, for uh, creating a, an array around uh, the path component, single path component that is uh, present, because that's what you want in your internal representation. So what we see here is that, is that this uh, sending this uh, more more abstract, more positional array uh, usually costs about two to four bytes per uh, relative query reference. 
So that's the, the cost. And of course, we, we now have to weigh the cost of uh, sending all these additional bytes uh, against the cost of uh, actually having to process and sort the components of the uh, curry into some internal form, which of course need not be this internal form. Uh, this is just one that, that I came up uh, during uh, implementing this. So next slide. Uh, what you should have noticed uh, in, in the previous slide is there, there are all these null things. And um, one idea was to uh, use the simplified array, uh, but do one tweak, uh, which is if you have two leading nulls, you can leave them out. And this can be done by, by disambiguating, discard all uh, from from other uh, null cases. So for instance, discard all could become true instead of null, which is discard equals true sounds like a good way to say discard everything. Um, so that, that's even somewhat logical. Um, so what happens here is that we mostly save two of these two to four uh, uh, additional bytes and uh, go to uh, one or two additional bytes. And that's much more palatable, um, I think, than, than using up, up to four uh, additional bytes. So this is the, the third proposal. Uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, none of this is, is written up in the draft right now, but it's what, what came up during the discussion uh, about uh, implementation um, issues. And uh, so this, this would kind of be a compromise uh, between conciseness, conciseness and simplicity uh, because it only wastes one or two, two bytes. Um, and, uh, but it still is mostly positional, except that at the start when you ingest it, you have to look at the first element of, element of the array once and decide whether this is the, the zeroth or the second position of the array that you are getting. Next slide. So the, the resulting syntax would uh, approximately look like this. I haven't really run this through, through uh, the tools, but th this should be approximately like it. Uh, so the tweak is that we uh, make the scheme and the authority uh, part optional at the beginning. And uh, then we ha uh, have a um, discard value um, actually, that, that should be an alternative with the, the other one. But uh, um, so we, we have a discard value. Uh, we have uh, a true um, as an alternative. And uh, then we have uh, the three components, path, query, and fragment, where path and query can be arrays or null, and fragment can, can be present or null. And since we can leave out trailing nulls, the whole thing is uh, littered with question marks here. So this may look complicated, but it's it's actually rather simple because it has this uh, positional uh, aspect to it. No, no parsing needed except for, for uh, this one tweak. So next slide and final slide. Um, at some point, we need to decide whether we are happy with the new syntax and some ingestion complexity, uh, whether we want to uh, uh, completely uh, change direction and go for the simple array, which has two to four bytes of waste uh, per uh, curry reference, um, or whether we want to, to stay somewhere in between on, on those, uh, between these two extremes and go for the simple array, but do the one tweak. Maybe we still are wasting zero to two bytes, uh, but uh, we, this now becomes uh, very, very easy to ingest. So that's what I wanted to say. And now, of course, I'm very interested whether people have any comments.
So hi, this is Hank. Sorry, I was very late and I actually, actually I'm not sure if my audio is working fine. Yes. Uh, okay. So hi, everybody. So I just was, I was uh, trying to uh, arrive here at slide one. I arrived at slide seven, but I'm relatively sure I know what this is about. Um, ingestion complexity is my topic that I want to reply to. I think that one of the uh, um, uh, one of the uh, reasons here why, uh, and that's another question, it's curry. Is, is that the official official spoken out uh, acronym of CRI? Is it curry? Like no. the dish? No? Okay. I'm, we I'm, haven't that's... decided on, on that yet. Okay, then then whatever curry will be. Um, <laughs> I, the, the, the ingestion complexity, I think, is, is, is the very important thing here. I mean, every tool can super reliably today um, effectively uh, uh, ingest this and, and, and process uh, your eyes. So CRIs are not only more compact, but to reduce some complexity on the ingestion, I think is always very important. So I would go with any tweak that reduces that. And uh, if that means that uh, uh, we have a compromise in option three, I do not see a, something speaking against that. So um, um, the, the, the option three seems to be not only a compromise, but a, uh, but a uh, I don't know, a conversion point where we naturally progress to. Um, so, so yeah, uh, one is therefore, I think, not even uh, an option, right? Or why, why is it still an option? Well, one is an option because it's the, it maximizes the one engineering uh objective we had uh, which was to be very compact uh and uh, still be reasonably simple to ingest i mean it's it's not it's still harder to do the actual resolution than it is to do the ingestion okay yeah that is always true but uh um okay but but still i think uh that that, that processing your eyes was always a, a kind of a burden and therefore, I, I think three is, to me at least, a very suitable compromise. Thank you. Um, so com coming from the other, uh, Christian, uh, coming from the other end of someone who is concerned with all, basically all the overhead that's going in with the with the sizes, um, so naturally leaning towards one. Um, three looks pretty good to me. Maybe we can kind of tweak a bit on on the on the complexity. Kind of do, do some tweaks there still, but something along the lines of three so, sounds good to me too. And we have also Klaus on the line now. Great. Any comments from you on this, Klaus? Can you go back to slide seven? Because I think that that has yeah. most what we have to look at. Hello. Um, like Hank, I missed, unfortunately, the whole presentation. So I just joined a few minutes ago. And um, But but the, the points that Hank raised are a very good um, input because um, it, it confirmed what I had as intuition in the beginning. And that is we, we really want to cut down on complexity on, on all fronts. And, and that includes the, the com implementation complexity and, and ingestion, uh, the, the size of the whole thing. So the, the aim is really to, to make it that simple for implementers to, to get this right and, and not develop a headache on, along the way. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what, what the differences now are between these three proposals. Um, but um, one, one question would be, is my in-memory format on that list, or is it something separate? Well, I, I was uh, looking at uh, CBOR-based okay. uh, yeah. solutions. Um, so, uh, the the um, what my implementation does right do right now is that it cannot actually do the CBOR-based formats yet. It instead has a that simple in-memory format, um, so it is, it's always a one-byte uh, option header that consists of, of the type and the length, uh, followed by the actual values of, of the path or fragment or query and so on. 
and, and that's it. So the the implementation overhead of that is is close to perfect, and and the simple uh, the, the format is also very very simple. And um, the the con is it's it's not seaboard, um, so not not extendable and also limited in the the maximum lengths, for example. And uh, I, I think question three then is more or less the same idea, but um, you, you would have the advantage of using CBOR and, and that includes um, variable length um, uh, items and you, you, you probably can use your, your pre-existing CBOR implementation. Um, so I, I'm... The, the, then we had uh, some discussions in the design team meeting um, recently on um, actually putting more features into CRIs. And um, that, that included things like uh, um, encoding um, items in, in the CRI that are actually binary and that are represented as base 64 example in your eyes. Um, that, that, that would be easy to do with uh, the CBOR based format and um, difficult to do with, with my in-memory format. So um, I, I'm, I'm personally a bit torn between making it that simple and having some nice features. But right now I'm leaning towards that simple and, and that, that is reinforced strongly by Hank's uh, comments. And um, I, I would seriously put this in memory format for, for discussion because it, it doesn't get simpler than that. And in, even the reference resolution then is um, just 10 or 15 lines of code. I think that the, the limitations in terms of length are too big to ignore here. So 32 bytes for each component means that if there is any, if there are any DNS names involved, that that can very e easily become they, they can very easily just become too long. Help if we had multiple host name options and they are joined by dots. Possibly, but the. But then again, that means that conversion bank. Yeah, well, possibly, yes. Yeah, so this is saying, so why, so because we, we now acknowledge and address the fact that URIs are composite identified with different semantics concatenated. Um, we can also play with the quantities of these once before unique items and apply meaning to them. I'm not sure if that is the goal here, but that could create some very expressive and so concise uh, uh, resource identifiers, but that is then beyond your eye, right? Uh, so, so the question here is how much powerfulness are we talking here about? Are we talking about your eye scope or the cool things you could do this when you look at Carson's last slide, uh, number nine slide? When you look at that, uh, you can play with cardinalities and add some semantic frostings here and there, and suddenly you have got super powerful complex identifiers. I, I think this, um, I think this was just really only about kind of taking the DN, taking the registered name apart by dots, hoping that it actually has has dot space separated semantics, and okay. kind of do, doing a thirty two by kind of doing the same thing that is done in in DNS in DNS names, just kind of splitting things up um, by by the dots which works as long as it's DNS and might become awkward otherwise. Well, the fun okay. thing, of course, is that, that DNS uh, actually doesn't have those dots. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you see the dots in a string representation of a DNS label, uh, but the DNS label actually is a sequence of, of text uh, strings. So it's the same as segments, but it's it's in the, in the it's DNS name. Yeah. So so um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so so you you can inherit semantics here yeah. and reuse them and then multi-scale them in the future. So yeah, I I don't see a issue actually. So on on, on the extensibility point, um, this uh, you can go back to slide four, I think. Um, yeah. Um, this uh, six element array is uh, pretty 
rigid. So that is not something that lends itself uh, to an extension point. Um, and uh, on the other hand, what's in there in these six positions uh, lends itself a lot to having extension points. Um, so um, if we think that, that these six components are actually the, the parts we want to have in, in curry references, um, then I think it, it's good to actually commit to this array. If we think we are going to unravel that and, and uh, put in various additional, optional something things in there, then we probably should uh, think more about that. Um, speaking as the, probably the main proponent of, of that extensibility, um, I'm not even sure we need to go there. So um, my current idea on that extensibility would be more to say that we can kind of work out of the box, take C vortex for whatever that is, for example, a, a named hash, a, a named hash value, and then declare that to be equivalent to um, to a query that has th these and those values. So um, maybe we don't even, even if we have the extensibility in there, maybe we don't even want that. Uh, we don't even need that and can just as well extend kind of outside of this. Yeah, but you can, so saying, you can always do that. That, that is a, a very universal extensibility uh, mechanism. Um, and I think the, uh, yeah. the way this is phrased here uh, implies that it is rather difficult to extend because this is an array with six items. So uh, the way it is framed right now already implies or, or tells the reader um, this is not intended to be extensible, I think, right? It's still intended to be mappable to a URI, and we don't have too many yeah, options. Yeah, okay, of that. course. Yeah, that is and, it, sure. And inside the components, yes, this kind of inside these components, this could still be extended. For example, by saying that authority is tag something that is a... a um, uh, I mean, we, we have we have provisions already in the field there for for your for IP literal authorities, but kind of say IPv future uh, literals could then just be extension points in the authority component. Okay, yeah. If 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 you are if, if somebody has to safeguard that extension point, of course, uh, and and realize that. Uh, uh, you cannot use the authority extension point for whatever cool new idea you now have because you are stuck with the six items that are URI uh, based. And uh, if that is okay, I th I'm fine with sticking and committing to the six ones here. Just We're just saying we're cementing this and um, that might be fine. Since we want to have this compatibility or, or translate Map mappability to your eyes. I think the, these items are fixed. Mm -hmm. um, but si since Seaborg gives us some some additional bits for um, defining the type, we, we have some extensibility here for um, expressing different encodings of, of the same information. So, for example, if you have uh, some path segment that in, uh, completely consists of uh, digits, then we could say we will allow um, to use a CBOR uh, UMT here as encoding instead of uh, having an uh, SQL representation of those digits. And, and uh, we, we could do similar things with tags um, to, to encode information more efficiently. Um, I, I would probably be a bit worried then um, about my, my dumb uh, constraint node. And that is receiving these CRIs in, in, for example, Coral documents. And then it's maybe a co-op URI or, or CRI. Uh, and uh, this constraint device has to construct the co-op request from, from these um, CRI. Um, if, if we do um, some, some extensibility here, th then the sender of the document needs to be sure that the constraint node understands that um, how, how to translate these different tags and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, th there I would be worried that we are again uh, moving too far away from that symbol. Well, 
But, but falling back to the base definition should be uh, always in scope for a constraint node device and uh, an ability to, to, to deal with text, that's what they're for. It's that pr proceed with care or, or don't at all, right? So, so that simple would stop at that mark. Yeah, would so with, with that the... simple, you would have path segments always encoded as uh, text strings. Oh, and you so... mean that. Um, you, you you would have your 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 integers always as uh, ASCII digits. You you would always write your base sixty four string, and uh, you you could not make it more compact. Okay, yeah, but that is the, that is I haven't that that not come to me because I really thought you would think about constraint device when you're talking about you in segments. I thought like okay, that is a a uh, you are I my my uh, my um, unsupervised long lived IoT thing would uh, sorry IO thing would uh, uh, I would really like to digest and create co op. Uh, uh, things for um, because that is not used for humans at all and can finally fall back to the useful automatic construction of uh, you and segment based uh, resource trees and and then you tell me but that is uh, not that simple anymore and and I would I would say no that that is a sacrifice I want to make for my <laughs> machines to be a bit easier right yeah um so the, the thing is um, that, that in co-op we have our options, our URI options. So in, in the end, you will always have to uh, decode um, the, the byte array into base 64 string or your Cbor unit into a, a co-op um, path option string. And so we, 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 we could have nice things in CRIs. Um, but the, the or, or original goal here was to, to keep it that simple, and that means just do a mem copy from the CRI and into your uh, co op uh, yeah. request data, and, and that's it. Okay, what you're telling me is not, not too much scope creep, but a few convenience uh, uh, um, features like, uh, and I want to come back to this, you and segments would be fine, right? Well, I still okay, your basically. So again, how large are your UMs? If you're talking about light band to M to M uh, object IDs, then it's just one byte anyway. Yeah, that yeah, that is true. That is true. I I'm, I I I wouldn't dare to claim that uh, that makes a lot of sense with small UMs. Of course, we are correct. Um, I don't think that all. This is still a, this is still able to express all your eyes, not necessarily those that are um, that are co-op your eyes. So there are cases when it may, might make a lot of sense uh, to to not even convert back to path to, to the path component. For example, uh, looking at named information um, uh, mm -hmm. and I hashes. Um, an optimization that I'd like to do there is to say, yeah, this is the URI is NI, and then that's that hash, and that the binary representation of that hash. Um, and I don't think that we have a, 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 an existing mapping for kind of how is NI used over over co-op. Over HTTP, it does get converted to a request to well-known slash for NI slash something with a base64 query. But if you were to do this on co-op, it would probably be converted to something well known, and then a fetch that contains the binary, uh, the binary encoded um, an IURI or something like that, right in the payload. So it wouldn't even need to be decompressed. So there's there are different use cases, and I primarily um, so kind of, I'm primarily thinking of those where the device would really never go all the way back through the URI. Con Back through what is optimized out, and mm -hmm. that could, Ideally. for example, be the case with with fetching things like like NI schemes, um, and similarly probably in 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 looking up. Um, so if if there's if there's something like um, compressing telephone numbers as they might be used in COBOL or SMS into some some binary form, then hopefully that binary form should be one that can be used to look to look basically to, to get the data right into where it's converted to the next medium rather than converting it back to a EU uh, uh, E164 or something number 
The telephone number case is definitely interesting. Um, and I also agree that um, we, we need things like hashes and Corel documents, for example. Um, but, but not only hashes. So I now have uh, somewhere in the back of my head a, a long list of uh, things I, I want to be able to express into Corel documents. That includes hashes or, or rather the thing that the hash uh, identifies. And uh, then things like geolocations um, or also public keys or, or rather the, the entity that holds the um, private key for, for a given public key. And, and then I want to write that public key into my Corel document. And um, I, I had a few more. And there the design choice is, um, do, do we want to be able to express everything as a URI or CRI? So I, I recently learned that there are geolocation URI schemes. And, and we have uh, the NI uh, scheme for hashes. And, and I guess we could e easily define a URI scheme for public keys. Um, or th then the other option would be in Coral that we have some uh, ways to um, encode um, data th that basically addresses itself uh, th through some other means, uh, as we do right now with floats and integers. So instead of defining an integer URI scheme, we will just write the integer as, as such. And that basically serves as a short form for, for your eye, where the your eye then resolves to, to that integer. And um, so we, we, we could do hashes and geolocations and public keys as, as literals and wouldn't have to force that into uh, CRIs. But, but the point with uh, telephone numbers is, of course, uh, appropriate. I think that the, that, that the approach of going through URIs helps a lot in, in interfacing this to other systems. So we can come up with, with lots of own ways of doing some literals, um, but at some point we may want to go into a system that, for example, and I know this is my example, uh, that, that ex, um, treats things in, in the form of RDF, and they already know what a geo URI is, and they might even manage to cope with a, with a data URI. And Kind of, we, we already have an, a kind of identifier that is universal and that so um, if we can stay within that framework, I suggest we try that. Um, my, my question here would be um, how, how do we make progress on this question because uh, it, it's not where, where we implement it and then do some measurements and, and then we have an answer. That's something that we have been discussing now for a while and and I, I'm not not sure how to come to a to rough consensus here. Well my, my plan was to simply write up whatever we decide today uh, and submit that as uh, dash or five and then make sure that we have a few implementations that play with that. Um, and uh, depending on whether we are happy we, we might want to ship it. We are also planning a design team for Friday, so you may take two days to digest or ingest this <laughs> before then. I would have to take a look at these slides because I haven't seen this before and I unfortunately missed the presentation. Um, so if, if we want to make a decision in this meeting, um, my, my vote would be for, for the in-memory format. So anyone else seem to prefer number three, right? For one reason or another. So, so this is this is uh, you lost me. <laughs> well, 
what, what, what are we in, in air quotes voting about exactly right now? What the next version of the document is going to contain. And and these three options are still that I now see again. There is there is a fourth option on the table, which is what is in what memory. Klaus is in memory format. Okay, I see. Okay, so in memory is now number four. I just wanted to make this very clear because it was prone to my interpretation. I think, and I might have been wrong. Okay, thank you. As I stated, my I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not changing my opinion to be honest. Uh, Klaus, if you want to get back into the slides and in way more details, we can get back to this on Friday. But do you think you can leave with number three? I, I missed what number three is. So, um, and, and I guess we, we don't have time to go through the presentation again now. So I, I would take a look until Friday. And um, th then uh, I might have a different opinion than now. But if, if you want to have a decision now, my, my vote, would, vote would be on, on number four the in-memory format. We can revisit this on Friday. But depending how it evolves, it can go to the list also. Okay, this was your eye compression. We actually had another point related to this agenda item, the dictionary set up using Seaboard Pact. And not sure if you had prepared anything of this, but uh, you have something to say. We have time. So who is you? Uh, no, I was really relying on you. <laughs> Karsten Klaus, Christian Thomas. So, shall I take this one? Please, yeah. Okay. Um, one thing that we've had in, in Coral for quite some time was this concept of having a dictionary that is basically um, providing um, providing relationship types and providing pre uh, predefined um, values to concisely express inside a inside a Coral document. Uh, now, with Coral being based on Seabor and Seabor packed now. Um, taking up shape, uh, taking up shape. Um, the rough direction from the last uh, work from the last um, sign team meeting was to use Pact Seabor um, to its full extent and um, align the way we set up our dictionaries uh, with the way the dictionaries for Pact Seabor are set up which is in itself a, a rather broad field. So there can be, uh, there's ongoing discussion on the CBOR list on, on that, that can be a pre-agreed dictionaries, which would largely be equivalent to what we've had so far in Coral, which can be um, pre-agreed, but referenced in the document, uh, also kind of externally defined, but referenced in the document. Uh, dictionaries and that can also be dictionaries um, defined locally for more complex expressions. Um, now we probably won't use, um, at least in the kind of interoperable generic form, all the uh, all the things that one can do with Pactibor, because that would mean like you could in could have really arbitrary kinds of table setups in arbitrary places, and that would be way too. Uh, way too unpredictable for Coral. Um, but right now we've decided to play around a bit with the with the facilities that are there and with the possibilities they give, and then look into how we can profile that down into something that is usable for Coral. So that might, for, just to give a rough example, mean that um, the the relation types and the, and the link targets can be substituted with dictionary entries and there can be a top level 
um, dictionary referenced outside and there can be a top level dictionary including a few commonly used fragments um, some some profiling along the lines of that and we'll just have to gather a bit experience about uh, on what makes sense and what doesn't Can this be realistically included in the upcoming version of the document or would it require more work? The, the, the nice thing about this is at, at, this, at this level of playing around with it, we don't have we kind of the, the current document kind of allows that it just provides additional means that we won't use anymore. That is uh, the, 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 the option to use a, a coral dictionary. We kind of, if, if we take coral as it is in the current draft and use an empty dictionary and instead use packed seabor, um, then this is already probably legal in, in terms of the, what coral right now says, as long as you admit the, admit these tags. Um, but that's right, right. And kind of remove tentatively removing the integer based compression and instead putting in language about that you would that you would usually um use packed seaboard to make things even more compact is something that's probably um be, that that will probably be the topic of the next uh core revision yeah i think the, the important um question here is uh how much of this actually is semantic and how much of this is just an encoding a representation issue so um for instance in c we have something called type def um, you actually don't de need need type def if you have hash include you could put every type into a file and then you can do a hash include on that file and then you don't need the type def but that's probably not what you want to do. You actually want to have the type defs on the semantical layer. You don't want to push this down to the syntactic layer. So I, I, I chose an example that, that's maybe a bit revolting, but um, sometimes it, it's dangerous to rely on the syntactic layer to provide some functionality if uh, actually processors intended to use the information at a semantic level because once you put it down to the syntactic level um, the processor officially doesn't see it and the discussion One. started not not with compression but um, with the need to assign compact identifiers to our, our semantic vocabulary and, and one way, of course, is to have um, something like glo globally unique um, uh, semantic identifiers and in the form of um, UUIDs or um, uh, some, some structured name, and, and then to compress those names. Um, but, but of course, um, the, the, the objective is to have these compact identifiers. And then in the end, um, what, what you want to achieve is also that um, in, you, you do not really have to decompress the Corel document to find out its meaning. Um, you, you would see these compact IDs and, and maybe map them into some, some local pointer or so to, to the semantics uh, in, in your constraint device. But, but you would never um, deflate the, the whole, no, inflate the, the whole uh, Corel document. Uh, back, back to its uh, decompressed size. Um, th th then um, wh where we came to CBOR Pact is um, if you then have these compact identifiers, um, you, you could of course also have those um, point at more than, than just identifiers. You, you could also have some um, shared dictionary between the nodes and, and use the, the same way um, of, of creating compact identifiers to, to identify things in these dictionaries. Um, so just to provide the background here. 
the the, the example about in, um, decompressing is also some one that that motivated the, the, this discussion here because if you think of the tags in terms of plainly sim, um, plainly syntactic compression, then this opens up for zip bombs, many lots, and all, all those kinds of odd things or dangerous things. And but I'm, I'm I'm not sure whether whether um, compression SIBO pact is really I mean, whether it's syntactic or semantic probably depends on the implementation. Um, it, but it's, it's not really defined, is it? Okay, so it's something to explore a bit more, but looks like some content can already be added about this in the next version. And of course, we can continue this track too on, on Friday. Anything more on this point or on href coral? Okay, then we are close to the end of the meeting, uh, unless anyone has any other business to raise. That's also no. So we can close the meeting. Thanks for today. Enjoy the rest of the day. Talk to you soon. See you soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.